Hello and welcome to another episode of Hot Takes, the Story Screen Presents podcast where we talk about new movies. As fresh as we can, not as fresh as we used to, but the takes are still hot. I'm Jack Kaljeski and I'm joined today by two lovely guests. One is Robert Anderson. Hey. How's it going, Robbie? It's going, man. This movie's fucking weird <laughs> and sad. Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, and I'm also joined by Bernadette Gorman-White. How are you, Bernadette? I am good. Are Thanks you for al- having me. Are you also as, as mind-fucked as Robbie seems to be? Yeah, I mean, there's no other experience than watching a Charlie Kaufman movie for the first time. It's true. They are pretty unique. Uh, so let's just hop right into it. We watched I'm Thinking of Ending Things, the new movie from Charlie Kaufman, uh, released directly to Netflix just this past Friday. So um, how how fresh is this for you guys? When did you guys watch this? Uh, for me, it is as fresh as like an hour and a half ago. Okay, so the takes are still yeah. hot from from good old. I put Robbie it in Anderson. a Tupperware pretty early. Very nice. It's sealed. It's in there, ready to. How about you, Bernadette? Uh, I watched it technically Sunday morning at like one in the morning when I got home from work, okay. and I was up until like four in the morning on okay. Sunday watching this movie, which I think. I mean, as I said, you're going to get an experience no matter what, but that was a fun time. It was yeah. a weird fun time. <laughs> Middle of the night viewing is honestly pretty apt for this movie, I would think. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was you that made that tweet on this, the story screen account that was like, it's 4 a.m. and and you don't exist anymore. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was me. Yeah, that pretty much sums up the uh, the viewing experience. I just watched it. I watched it on Friday night, actually. So I watched it the night it came out. We're recording on the following tuesday after so it's still pretty fresh out on netflix um either you guys want to take a stab at at summing up what this movie is in like two sentences for uh for a for a spoiler free kind of sell some Uh, sell our listeners on this movie it is uh you know kaufman-esque in the sense of of charlie kaufman movies but it is a uh i would say a, a surreal view of a relationship where one of the characters is thinking about ending that relationship and things get wild from there. Yes. And Charlie Kaufman, of course, if, if you, you are a listener who is unfamiliar, has done movies such as, uh, I guess his biggest one is probably, um, internal sunshine of the spotless mind. More recently he did Anomalisa. And then I never pronounced this correctly, but Synecdoke, New York. Is that Close enough. Synecdoche? I, th- I believe it's Schenectady. Synecdoche, New York. Oh, Schen- damn. Oh, okay. Sch- okay, like the place. Yeah. Okay, right. Just well, a little it's different. Well, it's written Yeah, for Synecdoke. sure. <laughs> Warchester. It's their fault for, for that. <laughs> yeah, because I uh, saw Synecdoche, New York before moving to New York and then finding out that there's a place called Schenectady, New York. I was like, oh, yes. okay. I okay, it so now. it's not written the same as the actual town Schenectady. No, there's like a letter, a couple letters difference. All right. Well, I feel less that's bad con- about that confusing. mispronunciation then. <laughs> um, and then also, you know, adaptation. Sure. Yep. Uh, being John Malkovich. Being John Malkovich. You know, he's he's a he's a man of of meditation and and writes about the meditations of the mind. So, where are you guys at as far as like Charlie Kaufman's other work? I think Bernadette, you're a big fan, right? Yeah, the only things that I haven't seen of his are uh, this movie called Human Nature, which he wrote, and it was directed by Michel Gondry, and I think it was the second piece of film he was involved with. And then I haven't watched Animalisa yet. I was going to watch it today, but didn't get an opportunity to crush it. That movie is neat, I would say. I Compared to his other work, I've... I guess I've only seen Anomalisa, I'm Thinking of Ending Things, and uh, Eternal Sunshine at this point. Um, but of those three, I would say probably Anomalisa was my least favorite one. I think it's cool. It has cool ideas, but I don't think it has as much going for it as those other two movies do. How about you, Robbie? Uh, I, I'm definitely a, a fan of, of Charlie Kaufman. He's uh, as as a aspiring screenwriter, he is a an influence on me and someone uh, whose work I really respect. I would say that uh, Eternal Sunshine, I think, is the one I'm the most 
familiar with and is my favorite. I also very much like uh, being John Malkovich. I definitely have some holes in my uh, viewing experiences with him as well. Uh, this movie in particular, I think it's it's like him unhinged, if that even makes any sense, if you're familiar with his work. I like think it's that's really fair. like it's really like the the Charlie Kaufman deep end. Um so if you haven't seen the movie yet, like get your brain ready for that. Yeah, maybe uh, not the first maybe if you're you've never seen any Charlie Kaufman's work before, maybe don't start with this one. Or do I don't know. Maybe right? <laughs> uh, yeah. If you want to just go, just go this straight an, in yeah. head first. This is a an end of the spectrum. If like this is this is a pole of his movies for sure. sure. It's, I don't. It's somewhere. Um, but yeah, I really I really like his work, um, and I really like his writing. I, I've read the I I own the the adaptation scripts like a bound version of it and the Eternal Sunshine script that I've read both, and they are he's a very good writer for sure. Yeah, yeah I, I think. Go ahead, burned it. Oh, I was just gonna say I agree with you when you're saying this is like definitely on a far end of a spectrum. Um, a lot of Charlie Kaufman's written work has been directed by other directors who right. can kind of like rein in the crazy. But um, this is kind of like a sister film for me to Synecdoche, New York, which was the first film that he wrote and also directed, and that is also like a total mind fuck. And you're just like, where is this going? What's happening? <laughs> when is this yeah. movie going to end? So yeah, I agree with you there. That is a movie I've been told to watch multiple times. And I've always meant to watch, but it's one of those movies where I think knowing what I, I know about that movie, I just need to be in just the right mind frame to watch it, to truly appreciate it uh, as much as I, I would like to. Uh, and I just do not often find my, myself in that mood. Uh, so one of these days the stars is going to align for me and I'm going to watch that movie, but it just not, has not happened for me yet. But with this one, I mean, um, we have a somewhat direct kind of relationship to this movie kind of because it was filmed pretty, pretty nearby. Um, I, funny story. I was sitting at, uh, were you there that day, Robbie? I can't remember. I don't think so. I think you texted I texted us you, you, right? Saw. Yeah. Uh, we were sitting at Bank Square, a local coffee shop, uh, in Beacon, and uh, this guy walked by and I was like, hold on a second. I like looked closer and then he like went inside the the coffee shop and I was like, was that uh, was that Todd from Breaking Bad? And sure enough, uh, <laughs> Jesse, <Big> Todd. <laughs> Jesse, uh, J- yeah, Jesse Plemons was was filming this movie in Fishkill. Um, so I guess he had been in town. Uh, and from what I heard from the people that worked at that coffee shop, he was a very nice, pleasant, down to earth guy. So good. So there you go. He You'll love to like hear he it. Be. That or he'd be like a sociopath, which uh, is is a character he likes to play a lot. Well, I mean, part of being sociopath is you got to keep up the, the social. Yeah, you got to show face, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you got to yeah, keep up true. the social pleasantries, <laughs> at least in the coffee shop. If you can't do it there, then you're fucked. You know, you're, yeah. you're not going to be, you know. Lowing, lowing your victims into a false your, sense. Your security. career will not last long, we'll say. <laughs> no. True. <laughs> so what did you, what did you guys think? Of this movie, um, I mean, I'm really, I, I, I'm really happy that we're the group talking about it. I feel like uh, the three of us have been have done a few of these really out there flicks and have elicited good conversation. Killing of a sacred deer comes to mind uh, as I say that. Uh, I really like the movie. Um, I was watching it with with uh, my girlfriend, and she was just like, "I don't fucking know about this," and I was yeah. like, "That's fair." But uh, I, I really really liked it um you know i I like work that can be interpretive and is designed to be interpretive in a very fruitful way way but i also think that like um if you ask mr kaufman what he thinks of it i think you would have some answers for it as well uh it feels very raw as well as at times it feels very just like pure like kind of like artistic overflow Mm -hmm. um i like that it's like I like that it cannot be contained. I like that it's like offbeat, sometimes like very literally, like in a very technical way. Um, uh, but yeah, I really liked it. It's it's something to chew on in a in a year where there's not a ton of chewy movies, and uh, I really pre- appreciate this uh, film jerky. It does kind of feel like a movie that's bursting from from its seams a little bit. There's a lot it cannot was, be contained. I was gonna say when you <laughs> mentioned the screenplays um, for some of the other 
Kaufman's work that you've you've read like this I would assume would be a pretty long screenplay because there is just a lot of dialogue in this movie like a lot and I could see that turning some people off in some big ways I could see a lot of this movie like not necessarily like being on the page like I could see like the screenplay even being short and then it's like as they're filming it like they're doing like let's try this or even yeah I think a lot of decisions happened in the editing room just by like the way the cuts happen the way that like some shots are so you could see that like you know some shots are, are pulled together from different takes very very much on purpose so I uh in terms of like from a screen writing standpoint and like off the page I, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of this movie isn't really on the page necessarily yeah I believe that I believe that and so that's what, do you, the, what do you think burn yeah that's the joy of writing something and then also guess getting to direct it is that you just kind of have an understanding of where it's gonna go and you're right it doesn't necessarily have to be written down um, I'm very interested in reading the book this is based yeah. off of because it's written by this man uh, named Ian Reed, and I'd imagine in book form some of the answers would be a little bit more concrete because um, it'd have to have some kind of real resolution that's tangible. Not always, but books tend to be a little bit more resolution heavy. So I'd be curious to see where it differs from the film because yeah, I I agree. I think. What I really enjoyed about the film itself um, were the the acting scenes with, like, the four main characters. I just thought that was so much fun to watch. These actors are really getting these great performances in in not that many scenes, which is really incredible. And then, yeah, like, the, the set, like, the mm-hmm. production design is incredible. Mm-hmm. And even just, like, the editing and the color palette, I think. This movie is a joy to watch. But it is a challenging film. So I would say if you are getting into this movie at the very beginning of the film, it doesn't let you ease your way into the film. It's challenging you from the get. So very, very well done. And I like movies that are challenging. So it's kind of my cup of tea. Yeah, I think, like Robbie pointed out before, this this trio especially likes stuff like that. Um, yeah, and I I think that this movie is definitely not going to be for everyone. I think it's going to turn a lot of people off. I think if you are familiar with Charlie Kaufman's work, you probably have a pretty good idea of what you're getting yourself into. But that said, it's even more, you know, even more so probably challenging than some, than some of his other stuff. Certainly more so than something like Eternal Sunshine, which I think is like a pretty... Mm, accessible like the movie most, probably the most yeah. accessible from his work it's the most out there a studio movie is gonna get like <laughs> you know what i mean like True. it's it's like it's definitely like like walking the tightrope and is getting weird but it's it's reined in for the most part this movie definitely feels like a blank check for for kaufman and he was <laughs> able to kind of do whatever he wanted with it in some ways because uh you know maybe it is more ambitious like um from an ideas perspective but it is a pretty low-key movie i think in the execution you know um the majority of the film is just two to four characters talking in in pretty like um small locations um which i think is interesting and that i think really allows like you mentioned bernard at those performances to stand out um which all four of the actors that are most prom there's a couple side characters here, but really it's the main four. Um, you want to list off all those names, Bernadette, because I th- I think you have the best name memory of <laughs> of the three of us. Well, it's Jesse Buckley in your lead, who is playing a character maybe named Lucy. Um, then you have we'll get to that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> then you have uh, Jesse Plemons, who is playing the character of Jake. So it's Jesse and Jesse. They're the leads. And then oh. you have Tony Collette, a joy as always. And then you have David Thewlis, uh, who is also wonderful in this role. And they play the parents to Jake. Yeah, I feel like you don't see him too often, but he's always awesome when he's involved in stuff. I wish he was in more stuff. He did all the Harry, or he did the one Harry Potter. Yeah, he, he was in a couple Harry Potter. He's in a couple Harry, Harry Potter. Yeah, that's how I. That's how I was introduced to him. Yeah, for sure. I, I think a lot of people probably as well. That's probably yeah. where a lot of people would recognize him. He was. As, uh, hey, that's um, Lupin. Yeah, and he was in Fargo, one of the seasons, played mm. the villain in that, and he also did the voice of the character in Animalisa. 
he plays the lead. Oh, nice. So. Oh, okay. That was him? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So just him and Tom. Yeah. Tom Noonan. Yeah. And I guess, uh, I think there's one other actress who's in that. But yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I think I really enjoyed the movie. I think it's a lot to chew on, um, and I'm really excited. You know, we've not really talked too much about the plot so far because I think we're going to save all that for just the spoiler-free zone. Or the spoiler zone, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the spoiler-free this is, this, zone. We're currently in the yeah. spoiler. You know, this movie's yeah. there's not a lot. It's, this movie's very liquid, so it's just got me in that kind of state of mind. I don't know what, I don't know what zone I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do think uh, it's there are some really cool ideas uh, at play in the movie. I'm curious to see, and I and I like that it's you know very abstract and open to interpretation, especially the ending. I think is fairly ambiguous. Uh, but I have a I have my own like specific theories, and I've been like really trying to not read anything online about it until we recorded this podcast. As soon as we're done with this podcast, I'm going to go read some think pieces on this movie, but. Wanted to go into this pure, so Me too. preserve the hot take nature as much as I could. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen a ton of like headlines for it, kind of either way, though, to be honest. I've seen um, some stuff pop up. You've seen some stuff? So yeah, it's, yeah. it's out there. People are writing yeah. about it. As they should. There's It's weird. There's a lot to write about, I would say, on this one. Yeah. There's oh, a yeah. lot to talk about. Uh, do you guys have any other spoiler-free stuff you want to mention before we go into the break? Would you recommend this to people? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I don't know. Like, it's if you're into movie, like, it's it's a it, you know, it's challenging. It's artistic. It's it's um, it's surreal. If you're into this dude's work, you'll be into this. If you're into like Yorgos Lanthimos movies, mm-hmm. you'll be into this. Like, you know, there's enough touchstones. I think that like for as crazy and out there as this movie is. Uh, it's not so crazy and insane where it's like, you know, you gotta be Mr. Hacha Cha Cha to fucking watch it. It's like, yeah, just check it out. So you got Netflix dog. What, the, what are you going to watch? The chef's table again, the barbecue episode Maybe. again. How many times <laughs> you guys see the mixed street corn? I don't fucking know. Watch this movie. Just try it. Just try it. Um, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, th- I, I think, yeah, you pretty much <laughs> nailed how I feel about it too. If- you probably, if you know about this movie and you know about the director, you probably know what you're in for already. And you probably know whether that's for you or not already. Um, and I do think that like this movie rides a line of pretentiousness uh, that would also maybe rub some people the long, wrong way. But I think that the performances are strong enough that they really anchor it down. Um, and even though this movie gets pretty out there and, again has a lot of dialogue to it some of it is you know a lot of it is sort of in the like hushed sort of breathy tones that i feel like do get associated with more pretentious stuff um but i think those performances especially you know the jessies um they really really hold it down and keep you engaged the entire time yeah yeah i i agree with both of you i think it's really important to kind of uh, watch things that are a bit educational from time to time. And this, I was even talking to Heath about it. And I'm like, man, I'm not familiar with a lot of the work that's referenced in this. Mm-hmm. And so it made me like eager to like learn more about the works referenced. Because I'm sure it'll make the understanding of the film itself a little bit deeper and richer for me. So I like that when I get confronted with something that's challenging like this movie is. But yeah. Uh, this was probably one of my most look forward to films of the year, and it did not disappoint. Nice. Yeah, they reference a lot of other works, and this, they it's kind of minor spoiler, but they say David Foster Wallace by name, and that's a name <laughs> that will either make you roll your eyes really hard, or be excited, or just be like, "Huh." Mm-hmm. So I very, I very much think the pretentious elements of this movie, though, are. It, it's coming from a self-aware place. Yeah, I think so yeah. too. I, think. I, I, I yeah. maybe that's maybe that's like breaching the spoiler zone sure. too much, but you know, I think I think there's certain there's a certain amount of like you know what, regurgitating art and things that we've read and and how our identities are made up. And I think I think uh, Charlie Kaufman is is wrestling with identity in this movie. And we will get into that, all that, and more uh, after a after a quick break. Okay, where to begin? 
with this one. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that struck me that I wanted to talk about is the, the scenes that take place in the car. Because there's two main scenes that take place in the car. It's like 40 minutes of the movie. And right? it's like a yeah. big yeah. bulk of the movie. <laughs> yeah. Which is, you know, not something that's always easy to do. Um, and I think that, that again, it's it's those two leads that really like pull that stuff off for me. And it's the same. Like, I, I think probably my favorite part of this movie is in the house when they actually are interacting with Jake's parents. But um, yeah, I guess I wanted to open up just by like those like those talking about those dialogue scenes even before we like jump into some of like this the uh the themes and stuff going on in this movie but did those those scenes work for you guys the whole movie worked for me yeah. i mean you know i'm i'm kind of curious not to like jump ahead but like i was wondering what like if we had to like try and like s- like spool this movie into a box like what genre you think it would be cuz to me it's like this is a horror movie like there are horror I was elements so, to it for sure. I was so anxious as I was watching it and it's like existential questions it was asking me as a viewer were were like filling me with dread and its use of repetition I thought was making me insane like it's more like it's to me this movie's like more lovecraftian than like lovecraft country like it's it's like a pure nightmare to me as a viewer and I, that's why I was kind of curious kind of where you guys were like even landing in that too and 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 not to like jump ahead of of anything I like the car scenes a lot. I think the car scenes are are very interesting and, and kind of like help fuel madness and make you uncomfortable. But that that's like the whole time I'm watching it, just watching this, I was like, this movie's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Yeah. No, well, we can come back. We can like weave the car scenes into that some of that other stuff. I like that idea a lot better to just start there. But yeah, this I think it is it is fair to call this movie a, like a psychological horror or just it's just like dread is the perfect word because I really think it 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 just ratchets that stuff up. It's almost <laughs> kind of reminds me of Mother, actually. Yeah, no I can see that. Yeah. yeah, I think it's uh, for me because yes, I've been seeing it build as a psychological thriller, which I think totally fits the bill. But for me, I think it's more of like an existential black comedy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because I do, I did find myself laughing multiple times sure. throughout the film. But I also feel like it was because the film was driving me slowly insane. Yeah. So I was finding things funny that I shouldn't find funny. While I, I was also terrified at the same time. I really wanted the movie to... Uh, I really wanted Netflix to do this thing where like, if you check the time, like how much longer is left in the movie, it would lie to you. Oh, yeah. And that I was like, be that'd so be good. so brilliant. Like, that'd be some next level shit. I was like, I wish they had the fucking nutsack to do that. Not enough movies play with that meta textual kind of stuff. Uh, even Bandersnatch, like, like kind of does a it. A little but... bit, yeah. But not even yeah. probably to the potential that it has. Like, um, sort of an eternal darkness kind of thing. Like, this movie yeah. just, just fucks with your TV clock or, like, turn just shuts off your, makes you re-log into your Netflix password or something. Mm. Uh-huh. Because, yeah, I, I liked that the trailer pretty much was like, this all takes place in this house. And then you're watching it and you're like, oh, no, I'm like almost an hour into this movie and we're barely not in the, the house. house. Yeah. I'm like yeah. in the barn outside of the house. <laughs> like, when when are we getting there? And then there's so much of the movie that takes place after the house. It's, it's incredibly well advertised because it kind of yeah. lures you in. Yeah, I, I abstained from watching the trailer for this one because I knew I kind of would want to go into it as fresh as possible. But it is it is definitely fair to call this movie a mindfuck um, because it, it really <laughs> it like quite literally, I think, is exactly that. Um, I'm curious what you guys. OK. What do you think is going on in this movie? If you had to like I, sum it up. I feel like the movie is because like to me watching it it feels like like i i just i was very much like had charlie kaufman in the forefront of my mind and i don't always do that with directors but i feel like there is some wrestling that he's doing in this film and because the characters themselves are so static it was hard for me to really even like throw too much motivations on them to begin with so it's kind of like more as a viewer obsessed with like the meta narrative that was happening in the movie, sure. um, which I do think the film very much lends itself to. And I'm, I'm a little disappointed with myself as a viewer, not with the film that like, maybe I don't know what the, 
kind of what the what the the goals or aspirations of of these actual characters are on screen well so i can definitely be convinced that this isn't even the plot or the overall narrative of the movie only because i don't fully believe that this might be it i think it's so fluid that it can kind of almost be anything you want it to be it's certainly open to multiple interpretations i think Right. So I kind of walked away with it at first, sussing out the idea that the janitor was the main character, Mm -hmm. this older janitor that we're introduced to throughout the film, Mm -hmm. and that he was experiencing kind of like a flashback event as he was dying in his vehicle. Yep. Or as, as he was beginning to die, he was having recollections of this encounter or multiple encounters that he's experienced throughout his life. Mm hmm. But added on to that, I wondered later on when I started thinking about the two main characters, the Jake and the Lucy character, I was wondering if the character himself was trans and he was wrestling with the fact that he never came out as a woman. Because it's kind of teased out throughout the film that Lucy doesn't really have a solid name and it's kind of like he's searching for a name for her. He calls her multiple things. And then there's just this one scene where you see a photo of a child on the wall Mm. and she's like, who is this? And he was like, oh, that's me. And she was like, no, I think that's me. And so I just wondered all of the repetition, all of the things that she had thought that she had written, which turned out to actually be written by someone else. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like he was really struggling with his identity. And it made me wonder if he was also struggling with his gender as well. That's possible. But I don't know. That's like a very like rich idea which might not actually jive with like the whole movie in its entirety but parts of it really stick out to me like it could be maybe arguing that but i do not know so lucy or let's just call her lucy for the sake of this discussion uh that's the first name that they give her Uh, because actually when you look on imdb the only character that's named is jake um Mm -hmm. he's the only one with a name his parents are just mother and father and then uh lucy's character is just i think listed as like young woman or something like that Um, i think you're right yeah so i i like that idea that maybe she is just a reflection of his own identity and his in his like older years as he's like reflecting back on his life because i'm with you i i think it's it's definitely a reflection of this guy's like life kind of flashing uh before his eyes um i saw it as lucy is effectively a personified memory so even though jake is probably the character who is experiencing this as it's presented to you the perspective really comes from lucy herself like she is the one with an internal monologue she's the one who is really experiencing this and sort of experiencing firsthand sort of the peculiarity of this um and i think a lot of the movie is about reflecting on your life at the end of your life um reflecting on past opportunities or mistakes or just experiences that you've had in your life and lucy is a character who is maybe just someone that this person had like a that jake had a small kind of romantic interest in like a short-term relationship kind of thing in the same way that you do you can think back to like oh this person that i was with for like a few weeks or something like that and is kind of representative of, you know, the sort of abstract or unreliable nature of memory um, in the way that she's constantly like, A, has a different name, constantly is talking about different professions that she has, um, and is experiencing Jake's memories kind of out of time and out of sync. So as he's, it's like, if there is a personified character within this person's memory that is experiencing him flashing back throughout time. And then that goes all the way towards the end of the film, which I think that the kind of musical number at the end there is his imagination, because at one point during the movie, he specifically says, um, they bring up the idea of uh, uh, physicists who have won the Nobel Prize together, like married couples who have won the Nobel Prize jointly. And it's, his reflection of like if i had if this was not just like such a short flash in the pan sort of relationship and if this relationship had a like 
come to be more than it was because like the character of jake seems to be feeling like this relationship is going to be more than it actually pans out to be because it's really lucy who's like i'm thinking of ending this already even though it's like you know is a short-lived thing um he's imagining like if they had stayed together if that had become like a a a more of a a long-term relationship like where his life would have gone differently because at the end of the movie he's a janitor and he is he's not a nobel prize winner at the very least um and a lot of that in there too is like reflections of you know commenting on movies and and art and like how we sort of idealize those things in our own mind he mentions how much he loves musicals and at the end like this idealized version of his the end of his life could have been this other thing and he's imagining that through like the lens of a musical so that's my like theory on what's going on yeah i i do like that i think that also helps me kind of add a little bit of context and weight to kind of what i've been trying to like suss out Mm -hmm. in my understanding Because, yeah, I agree with you that it was very important for him to have a a partner, Mm -hmm. which to me also fits into this, like, idea that he possibly just never fully accepted his full gender identity. And so maybe he is still masculine, but he wished he could have been feminine Mm -hmm. because in his uh, conversations with his parents, his parents seem accepting, but they also seem a little outdated, perhaps a little conservative. And it seems like they, and also he, kind of put himself in this box where he wasn't allowed to embrace, like, the femininity within him. Because, yeah, whenever he does think about other people and these dancers, there's always a male dancer and a female dancer. And to that, to him, that's beauty. But he never, like, fully gets to embrace that beauty for himself. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Robbie. I was going to say, I buy, I buy both interpretations. I mean, for me, outside of like the, the meta context, or maybe even to, to fuel that idea a little bit further, you know, uh, one of the quotes that um, Lucy has that sticks out to me is her discussing how she is like a current of time flowing through his family. Yes. Um, and, you know, to me, like, I, you know, in, in a past relationship I've had, like, I remember seeing uh, my partner's parents at the time and they... Uh, they hated each other and they just didn't get a divorce yet and they just kind of hated each other and i kind of saw my relationship through them in a way and it made me kind of want to end things because i was just like this is such a toxic thing i don't want to ever end up like this so for me like you know this movie starts with this woman being like i'm thinking about ending things i'm thinking about ending this relationship and as she sees as she meets his parents she kind of like just sees what the end looks like who knows what point in time she um is actually meeting these people but what she sees is just kind of like the the heteronormative married lifestyle kind of like have its end in front of her and she's just like it just ends up like this i think the movie is also you know i think between all of our interpretations you know the film has to is definitely concerned with age Mm -hmm. uh kind of what life means the meaningless of life the meaningless of identity uh, I think the film was very nihilistic at times. I think there's very little hope. Um, and yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a, you know, it's kind of a bummer of a flick. And, uh, you know, I like all of these interpretations, but, and I think it's hard because I think there's, there's also so many scenes that kind of like divert our theses away from itself too. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, even like all three of us, I think, you know, we could probably find a scene each that would, argue against our points and i think that's like that's interesting which is why you know i I have trouble thinking you know and i think no one would argue that the film has any concrete objective i i don't think that's the case no i think it 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 on purpose invites multiple interpretations and then that's i mentioned before i feel like this movie is kind of overstuffed a little bit in that way where it's like because of the way that the character when these characters are talking to each other and they spend a lot of time almost kind of rambling to each other and flowing very um you know at times it's sort of jarring at times it kind of flows dynamically but like going from one especially in the car and that's why i want to come back to the car some more but like just flowing from one conversation to the next with each other um and i think because there's so much of that dialogue in there and there's so much like there's so much detail stuffed into it 
that it's got these sort of like broad strokes of themes, but also like you said, Robbie, that there's like you could probably pin a theory to any number of of lines that are in there because there's so much. Mm-hmm. But I definitely, you know, the idea of like of of aging, of regret, of looking at things in in hindsight, of interpreting your life through multiple different lenses, and and sort of the um, the fuzziness of memory there and remembering things like in different ways happening different you know the the unreliability i guess of memory uh is definitely one of the things that stands out to me there yeah i think that's probably one of the you know longer like that's one of like the that's one of the themes that runs congruently with the movie Mm -hmm. whereas a lot of ones kind of like run for a little bit and then stop whereas i think like the idea of of memory kind of being a, a loose concept and the idea of memory being fuzzy and like, you know, I, I think this movie, I believe, is some version of remembering your life mm-hmm. in some way. Whether it's from the perspective of Jake, which him being kind of the only named character would make a lot of sense. Um, but then I'm like, but then I have doubts about that theory because we have so much inner monologue from Lucy. Um, so I'm just like, well, why, you know, if, if we're following this dude, how does he know what she's thinking? So we can't. So for me, I'm just like, well, can we even be in one person's head you know and that's and uh it's but it's cool that the movie can be all of those things again that's like why you know I, I, that's why i really like quote unquote like mother uh mother because uh when we did that podcast we like we're like what do you think the movie's about we all had three different answers mm-hmm. you know it was just like what the fuck <laughs> and then of course darren aronofsky's got to get out there and start fucking doing interviews and like yeah, you know putting his own it. work into a smaller box than it fits in i think uh, my it's hope so is that Charlie Kaufman does not make the same mistakes because, you know, the best way to go about it in interviews like that is it just makes me think of the David Lynch meme where he's like, he's asked to elaborate <laughs> on something. And he just says, no, like, just say no. Just yeah, let says, your work. Yeah. He says, God is a woman. There you are. Yeah. And they're like, do you care to elaborate on that? No, he says, no, <laughs> you don't have to. Um, and I think that this is the kind that that is something that is special about this movie um, and is more inherently found, I think in movies that are more challenging or more arty or pretentious, if you want to say that word, but um, it invites all these different interpretations. um, And it's maybe not as like just up and down straightforwardly entertaining as some movies, you know, the entertainment value might not be as high as other stuff, but I think it invites a lot of, you know, entertainment in the idea of processing it and thinking thinking your way through it yeah because it could even be something separate than any of us have said and it could be that this janitor character is a man who just works in a school who gets little tidbits of english and science and math and you know he's just around a school atmosphere all the time that he's kind of concocted this play in his sure. head and this is like the performance of this play that he's imagining as he's dying so it might not even be an actual memory that anyone had so yeah it's just really interesting well, i think that idea is definitely in there too the way that the like media and art and stuff does kind of work its way into our memory um and does kind mm-hmm. of reshape the lens that, that we process our own memories um, and even art that we experience in a place and time throughout the course of your life can have sway over like memories from that time. Um, and I think mm-hmm. all of that sort of just like plays and, and the fact that all those things are in there and they all kind of meld into each other and all work with each other, uh, I, I think in sync um, speaks to, I think one of the other big strengths of this movie yeah yeah so i know i don't own long car rides but being from the midwest like taking long car rides is just kind of like the norm that's what you have to do to to go to the grocery store (laughs) yeah take a long car drive um things get farming so yeah (laughs) yes that's like my home turf um but yeah all of that really landed with me especially the scene where um Lucy is looking out the window as she's reciting this thing that she's written, but she's looking at the camera. Mm -hmm. That really landed with me 
But yeah, I really like the idea of being in a car with someone and kind of drifting in and out of conversation as one does, and also kind of drifting in and out of sleep or trying to Mm -hmm. sleep. Car rides do have this very like lulling, hypnotic effect on you if you've been in a car long enough. And so I thought it was very well done. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, they, they get that across for sure. Go ahead, Robbie. Uh, I was going to say, I like the, you know, I like the red line diner scene, which we have to shout. Yeah, we have to shout out as as people have probably all been there before. Um, but, you know, with that scene and, and the idea of like the idealized relationship happening, like the idealized like um, act of love that happens in that in that uh, movie within a movie. And uh, yeah, and maybe that does contribute to the idea of, of like media bleeding into your mind or or what the ideal relationship should look like. Um, the same with like the dance. But then you have the dance where you have uh, Jesse Plemons fight the janitor. And it's like, is he fighting himself? Is he wrestling with himself? Is he, you know, it makes me it makes me also wonder, like when people who have dementia or Alzheimer's, when they reminisce, like, what does that look like for them? Which the can't film, look like the same way we we see it, right? You know, and the film addresses that specifically as well. Um, yeah, with with Jake's father experiencing dementia mm-hmm. in his later years, um, mm-hmm. and there's that is an anxiety I think that plays in this movie, um, and that's maybe where the the more existential dread horror sort of comes from. It's just this the entire vibe of the movie is this just kind of anxiety around aging and dying and remembering your life yeah and that can add um some truth behind possibly the janitor being the character who is remembering Mm -hmm. his life because the dad does say yes i'm starting to forget things so i have to label them and the fact that Jake is the only character with a name, it's like he's trying to label himself to remember himself. Yeah. But no one else has a label, really. Right. I think there's a, there's, there's a strong argument for the movie being all kind of like in Jake's head. Especially with like the ending scene where he he is accepting a prize that he may not have actually ever received. He <laughs> is yeah. uh, also trying to remember his childhood bedroom that is kind of given to him for him to lay down on. And then the movie ends in kind of a bright light. You know, that's... It, this movie could be like you know it's the DMT release before you die or as yeah. you die, and that's what this movie just is. It's kind of like brain chemical nonsense on the precipice of being dead. Um, yeah, his brain is thinking of ending things. Yeah, you know, it could totally be that. Um, and and again, the only things that make me disagree with that thesis too, and and I think it's 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 brilliant that the movie has this in there. It's just the fact that we have our internal monologue from someone else, you know, or, or it could be him or it could be him. But I think a lot of times like it's, it's in direct opposition to him. Like a lot of times he feels like to me, as I was watching it, he feels like the antagonist of the movie or, or as like a source of anger and, 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 uh, and kind of can like let you know, he's, he's, he has a short fuse at times and he, he gave me a lot of anxiety as a character and made me kind of like, be be worried for for Lucy's character, you know, and then when they go to the ice cream place and they're just like, "Hey, we're worried about what's going to happen." And you're like, "What the fuck does that mean?" Mm-hmm. And then she kind of her character gets kind of abandoned uh, at a certain point in the movie, and it's just like, "Well, where did she go? Where'd she go now?" <laughs> you know, and I think, and, and I don't know really what to make of that necessarily. You know, she she seems to be more than an object of desire in the in the movie and how she's positioned you know because she has um i don't know about agency but at least screen time and screen time away from from other characters you know i think she's a good and that's why i I like my my own theory of her being a personified memory because you're taking you know you're taking a direct sort of narrative structure where you're just somebody's like kind of remembering their life as it flashes by them and thinking like what would it be like for a memory to experience its own part within someone's psyche or framework um yeah. and that kind of explains both her confusion as things are happening but also her acceptance of what's going on you know um mm-hmm. and you know if you want to try to 
think about maybe the way that say the Jake's character or Jake is like the main character and say he did actually date someone uh, that looked like Lucy and maybe she was a writer or maybe she was a biologist or maybe she was a physicist. It doesn't really matter um, because again, memory slippery like that, but to kind of frame that perspective from an outside view and give you some of that, like the negatives of, of Jake's perspective as well. Like that's kind of goes back to that idea of like looking back at your life and being filled with regret and thinking that, um, you know, maybe this could have gone differently for me. Um, and maybe, you know, my dreams would have been realized. And again, for me, that's the kind of like musical theater part at the end is like what could have been. And, um, you know, the dance scene to me reads like the reason that that stuff didn't happen. The reason that things didn't go any further with, with Lucy is because of Jake's own, you know, issues. Like he was the reason why things ended it. She's the one who wanted to end things with him. Um, Mm -hmm. so you get that kind of regret from his character through that external lens that is really internal at the same time all that just like adds a wrinkle i think to like the narrative structure and makes it more of a unique movie yeah yeah i love all the stuff that you're you're saying because it's like pretty much exactly how i feel too except i think when jake is older he's really regretting not letting himself be lucy Mm -hmm. Because he used to paint when he was a boy, but then he gave that up and he stopped painting. And it seemed like he had an affinity towards the English language and wanting to be a writer or wanting to be all of these things. And Lucy is kind of like the representation of all of these things that he never let himself be. And it seemed like whatever happened at that dinner, whether Lucy was actually present or not, probably like solidified like oh well, i can never really embrace mm-hmm. that side of who i am and the rest of his life he just decided to be jake and jake only right. and so he's really experiencing a moment where he's looking back and he was like that's the the moment that lucy decided to end things with me like that aspect of my personality decided to cut the cord and i buried it and i just like got rid of her entirely and lived the rest of my life in this very sad and tragic way where it seems like he was a pretty well-educated person who seemed like he was working towards things but then for whatever reason ended up in his hometown again which there's nobility in that too uh living in your hometown and working at your high school i don't think that's a bad thing at all but it seems like jake is really wrestling with the fact that he settled for less than what he possibly could have been for sure yeah yeah I mean, you could look at the ice cream scene as like, you know, they're like, oh, they they don't talk to me and the two girls are laughing at him. Maybe that's like a trans allegory that he was like in uh, like female attire and there was only one person there who would be nice to them and the other two women were laughing at him. And he's just like the boy, the boy version of me cannot go to order order from them. I have to be someone else or maybe it's like not even an ice cream place. It's like a different interaction. I think that feels. I think there's, a, you know, I yeah that interpretation that that you have, Burn. I did not see coming at all, and I think I do think your your arguments are very valid for it. I think they're very interesting. Again, I I think the, at the end of the day, I I don't I don't think the movie's super concerned with any one allegory, and that's why I really wonder, like we said, kind of at the top, like what the book's about, you know, and what and what drew uh, Kaufman to to uh, adapt it. Yeah, I agree with you. There's absolutely enough ambiguity within the movie that, you know, it could affect different viewers in completely different ways. And you could have your own separate, unique takeaway from it. Um, I think that's what makes movies like this more interesting is to hear people's completely different theories. And that's why, again, I held off from reading anything before this podcast, but I can't wait to go read uh, some other takes and some other um, thoughts about it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, Robbie, you brought up that ice cream scene. That's probably, it's the standout scene Mm -hmm. for me of the film. And yeah, what did you guys think? What was meant about like, we're not uh, like painting back there and her arms are all like scarred. Mm -hmm. 
Like, yeah, that scene was just so interesting to me, and that was probably the most perplexing scene for me to watch. I mean, you know, I think, unfortunately, sometimes you remember people because of their uh, quote-unquote flaws. Um, so, you know, if, if we have characters who are remembering their lives, like, that would be a standout person. But then, like, what do we make of the two women who are clearly, like, laughing at him? Mm-hmm. You know, like, trying to be a source of embarrassment, and but then you have someone who's being nice to you. Uh, like, what do you make of would make of that but then that character is also concerned so it's like uh you know in terms of what that scene means in the, in the grander patchwork of the movie quilt i don't know i don't know uh i really like that movie uh vis- or i like the movie i like that scene visually especially the wide on just the ice cream place like in just pitch black with snow i thought that was like like i want that frame i, I love that shot in the movie yeah, that's very much like Eternal Sunshine, where you yeah. would see Joel and Clementine like out on the lake, and they'd be like basically in a spotlight, but everything around them was dark mm-hmm. and snowing. Yeah, it was a good callback type of like visual reference. Yeah, like that surreal type of uh, imagery where you know like something is not where it should be, you know, or or like a fusion of two locations that don't make sense. Well, I mean, just the. The fact that they're going to get ice cream in the middle of this like blizzard is very much like. <laughs> and then they don't even drink. The same, right? I thought, I thought they were poisoned for a second because they're talking about doing the stuff in the back room, mm-hmm. and I was like, did they put that stuff in their in their f- frozy frozy beverages? And then then that didn't happen. I was like, all right. And then when it gets thrown out in the dumpster that's outside the school, that dumpster is full of those. Full of them. Things. Yeah. Yeah, there's think, there is a you could I think apply like a sort of dream theory to everything that's going on yeah. in this movie. It's I mean, you know, the I basement a, as well. Like mm-hmm. the basement was a yeah. big scene too. I mean, I had a moment until kind of the end where I thought we were in another you know uh, Groundhog's Day, Russian Doll, Palm Spring movie mm-hmm. where things are you're stuck in repeat repeat land and and this is just a thing that happens, but. You know, I'm I'm less inclined to go with that theory, just given the fact of the way the movie ends, and because there's no inciting moment that explains, like, you know, because in all those movies, there's there's some amount of like passage through something that creates a loop, you know, or like glitch or thing, and this movie doesn't really have that. And again, I I think the movie is far less concerned with a construct like that narratively. So I think that's an inherent yeah. idea behind memory as well, as you revisit those memories. The loop over and over again or you could yeah yeah there's that great shot of lucy going down the stairs and it's like oh yeah 10 staircases uh-huh. long instead of just like the one loop of staircase that mm-hmm. she should be walking down yeah like that scene too a lot mm-hmm. the movie feel especially the first half of or the the scenes all the scenes that take place in the house just feel like an acid trip gone wrong um the way so things are constantly and changing and the way yeah. that you know the dog shows up and the dog is just not right um <laughs> no. <it's> shaking yeah <laughs> um the way that people's clothes are constantly changing like even lucy herself she is constantly her earrings change her clothes change his dad's clothes change jake i think is the only character whose clothes do not change um, throughout, but there are like appearance and clothing changes for the other characters. I think his clothes actually do change because he has the uh, the button down and the suit jacket up until they're leaving, and then he's like in the vest and a different button up. Mm. And then so so you know even even his attire is I believe subject to change. I mean that happens so much later where it's like maybe he just did change, but this movie I don't think is I don't think anyone just changes in this movie. It's just one <laughs> of those <laughs> classic movie goofs. You know, yeah, Oops. It's like, oh, it's, <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if the shirt was in the dry movie. cleaner. <laughs> I wonder if people are watching this movie, like anyone who's like, oh, this is, oh, they, there's a, there's a error. There's a plot hole here. Like this doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that movie's full of plot holes. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Welcome, my Turns friend. Turns out <laughs> Jake's uh, brain is just Swiss cheese and that's why it's holy. I think that is, I think that is what is going on. Yeah. Old man Swiss <laughs> cheese brain. Yep. Well, man. Is anything in this movie real? No. Is anything real, Robbie? I guess not. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to touch on the scene specifically in the car when they're talking about she becomes a, a movie critic for a few minutes. Because to <laughs> me, mm-hmm. I hated that scene. That scene really landed for me because, A, I yes. thought it was really funny and you could see 
you could see the two different like methods of film criticism kind of be not even methods but like the way that movies affect people differently and you could see you know Kaufman a little bit probably poking fun at movie critics and like you know the smoking movie critic who's just got all this like really fancy vocabulary to describe this movie and all the different stuff behind the movie and then you have Jake who's just kind of like yeah I don't know it just kind of like I thought it was nice and it, it connected with me emotionally and like that's that and she's just like oh well you know like just that kind of back and forth there the different kind of like interpretations that you can have of a movie and I feel like you could write something like that about Kaufman's work like you could find probably a deep critical analysis of something like Spotless Mind that somebody's written and then you could also find you know the take from somebody who's just like I don't know it was just sweet and made me kind of sad and I liked it you know yeah both are valid in that way they're Mm -hmm. always both valid yeah yeah but it was it was funny to me to see Coffin like directly put that in there and that those are some of the more like meta moments where i'm just like ooh, i feel like this is like him like maybe him dating someone who is like very affluent in film as well and he and they're coming at it from two very different perspectives like i can only imagine being like a director or writer dating someone who's uh, a film critic and and the fun fights you'd get into (laughs) i'm not even dating i just feel like it's charlie kaufman just being like fucking film critics man (laughs) Yeah, maybe. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's too. It's funny that the like diner scene, the romance movie within the movie, is a Robert Zemeckis. Yeah, that, that was, was funny. <laughs> that was very, very funny. funny. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's definitely some fun, some fun being poked. You know. Oh yeah. <laughs> and in that way, from like the meta meta textual layer of it too, it's like this is. It feels very much like Kaufman kind of working through things, his own thoughts and feelings about like his own life and his own career. In a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, Zemeckis, too, he was, he did Forrest Gump, correct? I think so. Uh, but yeah. We're going to sound like real movie schlubs if we got that wrong, but I think that's correct. <laughs> I always sound like a movie but yeah, schlub. The, the fact that it was about, like, a character, like, revisiting his hometown and, like, hitting all of these different touchstones in his life was, like, very Forrest Gump to me. <laughs> In, like, a very, very strange way. He also wrote Back to the Future, Flight. Mm-hmm. Uh, he produced Beowulf. Oh, God, Beowulf. <laughs> yeah, he's got a crazy career, yeah. for sure. <laughs> but, yeah, like, uh, Forrest Gump, it does, you know, take a character and kind of put him in moments of time where the Forrest Gump character actually wasn't. Sure. Mm-hmm. Like, certain interviews and uh, certain, like, moments of history. So I thought that was, like, a funny way of including that type of idea in this movie. The fact that he could have chosen any director to put at the end of the movie. Yeah. But he he put Robert Zemeckis, and I thought it was a fun nod. This movie is also, like, the polar opposite of anything cookie cutter, you know? Like, yes. any, <laughs> anything, anything that's resembling just, like, your typical Hollywood studio movie. It's like, this is just ab- absolutely the pure opposite of that. Whether he's coming at it from like a, a fun way or a middle finger, I don't yeah, know. It's hard to tell. I think it's fine. I think it might be a little bit of both. Who knows? It's hard to know? tell if it's playful ribbing or or Kaufman yeah. being like, "I hate this fucking corny shit." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's just not my vibe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple of the things that we didn't talk about yet that I just really loved. I loved all the Tulsi Town cartoons. Mm-hmm. I yeah, thought that cool. was great, um, and I really liked that. Talking pig, that talking dead pig. What do you voice that pig? Mm-hmm. Oh, shit. He sounded so I familiar. It, early. it wasn't, it wasn't Tom it Newman, was, was it? I think it was Oliver Platt. Oliver Platt. Doesn't ring a yes. bell for me right away. Um, I What I really remember Oliver Platt from was he was in a Three Musketeers movie. But he's this guy. He was also oh, in a Fargo. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I Fargo recognize season. him from Fargo. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I actually... At first I thought it was Paul F. Tompkins, but it wasn't Paul mm. F. Tompkins. It was Oliver Platt. Robbie, anything else you want to hit on before we kind of wrap up here? Uh, I really like this movie. I'm curious uh, how I'm going to feel about it in a few days and weeks and months and years. Yeah. How I will remember this movie fondly as I lay on my deathbed remembering all things. This is one... Uh, <laughs> 
This is one that I think would do well for a second viewing, but I'm going to give myself some time before I go ready. back and watch yeah. it again. Because it's, um, <laughs> it's a lot. It'd be a lot to, to watch again, but I think you might pull a lot more from it watching it a second time as well. I definitely want to read some stuff on it for fucking sure. Mm-hmm. It's definitely it's one of those, you know. Last question I'm going to hit you guys with before we wrap up. Do you think that was actually Jesse Plemons singing at the end there? Or do you think that was like a different someone else singing there? I wouldn't be surprised. It kind of sounded convincing enough to me that it could have actually been him. I think it was out of sync for the sake of the visual of it. Yes. Yeah, sure. But I think I wouldn't be surprised if it was actually him performing it. Because we'll like a lot of actors yeah. have musical theater backgrounds and shit like yeah, that. A yeah. lot of actors can sing, yeah, yeah. sing the shit out of stuff, you know? Definitely. Maybe not, he's, he's maybe a big not Joe guy, Pesci, big but pipes, most guys. I yeah, imagine. Sure. Not Joe Pesci, no. Maybe Joe Pesci. I don't know. <laughs> what say? I never heard him sing. Uh, Joe yeah. Pesci, if you're listening, hit us. Send us, us, now. Send us your download tape. We'll be, we'll be, <laughs> the, we'll be the American Idol for, for your one song. Perfect. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a no from that's me, a good Yeah, that's a good pivot. I think we could get into that. I think we could get into yeah, that. I'm with it. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Um, check out this movie on Netflix. If you have not already, I would say even hearing us talk about it, you could still go watch it and still kind of be like, what the fuck mm-hmm. happened? I don't yeah, know. You might not know. Who can yeah. say it? Maybe you have a completely different uh, interpretation, which if you do... You can hit us up on any of our social media platforms. Uh, if you like Instagram, it's story underscore screen underscore beacon. And then if it's mm-hmm. Twitter, it's story underscore screen. Um, I think we're on Facebook too and all that jazz. You can probably just type in story screen or you can go directly to our website, storyscreenbeacon.com and check out all sorts of articles and podcasts and other kinds of content you guys want to plug anything while we're at while we're here i don't really have a a story screen plug per se but i will say if you like this movie check out synecdoche new york because i do think it's a spiritual sibling film to this and i think you'd really like it but yeah, we have a lot of fun stuff going on at Story Screen. Just check out that website. You'll find it. Check it out. And also, uh, Drive-In Movie Theater. Come yeah. visit us. Uh, because despite movie theaters still not being allowed to open in New York, Story Screen has you covered if you are dying to see the big screen. So come by, Tom Cruise. We've got you covered. The biggest, the <laughs> biggest screen. Back to the cinema again. We got the biggest screens in Beacon. That's a fact. That is a fact. That's true. It's true. <laughs> That's a fact. Cannot be argued against. Cool. Well, thank you again, Robbie and Bernadette, for joining me. Anytime. Once again, I'm, yeah, I'm Jack Kolodzewski, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.